So we are so thrilled and honored to bring this next guest on. He's one of my idols in broad in sports broadcasting. He's the lead broadcaster for NBC Sports. He's a renaissance man. He does it all. Olympics, golf, hockey, horse racing. Mike Tarico, welcome to the show. Joe, good to be with you guys. It was a lot of fun. It was a great, uh, great derby weekend. I think we're just starting to come back out on the other side here and look ahead. But, man, it was, uh, it was fun being there. The 150th lived up to the billing, didn't it? It was absolutely incredible. And, you know, one of the things that, that I love about you and, and your style is like you you were thrust into the, the horse racing world and you could never tell that you hadn't done that much horse racing broadcasting before. Like you spoke like an expert, like a seasoned vet in racing pretty much from day one. Do you have a background in racing at all? And if not, what was kind of what was your process like to get up to speed? Sure. So I grew up in New York in Queens. So uh, being around at that time two, really three tracks when you include Saratoga uh, and the Saratoga Beak uh, covered in the New York market and two harness tracks as well uh, at Roosevelt and Yonkers all were racing. It was racing on a regular basis. The race results were always on the local news that race results every half hour on WCBS radio in New York, and they would give the prices of the races, right? And uh, with family out on Long Island, we'd get out to the harness track and what it did was it allowed me to learn how to read the form. And you got to start there, right? If you don't know how to read the form, then you just got no shot. So I learned that at an early age. And I wouldn't want to say that I went to Belmont or Aqueduct a lot, but went a couple of times, so kind of knew what was going on. And then I got in local TV up in uh, Syracuse, New York, when I graduated college. And we covered a, a Finger Lakes track up there. So I had a little bit of a sense of the sport, right, and followed the big events like many. But, you know, to say that I had a background in it anywhere near somebody like Tom Hammond, who was just incredible doing it, right? Tom had not only all of his years living in Kentucky and covering the Derby, but also a degree in equine science. So, like, you know that you're not there. So just try to prepare for it the most you can. Be familiar with the terminology. I think I learned that from being a golf announcer early on in my career, that you have to have the proper use of knowledge to gain the respect of a fan base in a sport that is more of a, a niche sport. And that's said not in a negative or prerogative way at, at all. It, it, it's just the reality that, you know, it's not football, it's not basketball, it's not baseball. We don't all grow up doing it. So right. uh, that's how I kind of went about it. And you know, hopefully, hopefully I lean on Randy and Jerry every once in a while and make my way through it. And, and this year in particular, it was 150th, so it has that, that extra sexiness to it because it's, a, you know, such a, a longstanding part of uh, Americana. And, you know, there's a bunch of stories that are, that are going around between are we, you know, worried about all these horses finishing? Are we worried about the Baffert discussion? And yet record numbers across the board, record numbers in handle, yeah. record numbers in view, you know, viewership, in watching the race itself. What do you feel was the biggest takeaway from this huge Kentucky Derby weekend? Well, I'm going to give credit to my employer, but I have nothing to do with that credit. I think NBC, way before I got involved here, helped to build the Derby to an event. And we are an event culture and country right now. Uh, can you create celebrities want to be there? Can you create digital buzz? Can you create all of this? For the most part, I'm going to guess that most of the people who watch the Derby broadcast, that's going to be the only race they watch all year. And mm -hmm. I hope it brings more people in and keeps them going through it. But the reality is when you look at the number of 20 million come the, the quarter hour of the race, we don't see five, six, seven million people watching any other races during the year. Right. So right. Uh, it, it, it tells you that the, the eventizing to create a word, has helped elevate the stature of the Derby, and that's just growing on itself. Now, that's why it's important that that becomes a really good day. Full credit to Churchill Downs, the card was really good. It was stacked with grade ones, twos, and threes. I think he had eight graded stakes in a row. I think six in a row were ones and twos, or five five in a row and six out of seven. Mm -hmm. uh, so you had that, right? Where you, Last year, you had the issue with the terrible week around the Derby and fatalities with a horse, including on the track during Derby day last year, it was just a big negative on the sport on its biggest day. So if you sample something and it's not good, if you go to a restaurant and the meal's not good, you're not going to go back. So it's important that it was a good day all the way around. And, and it was, and that's the work of Churchill doing the safety thing as much as possible. 
HISA, whatever conversations you want to get into HISA, you know, the impact that that hopefully will have to make it safer, smarter, and people understanding it better. So all that coming together, I'm so glad it was a good day. And it, we got the race of a lifetime, really. Absolutely. Yeah, we were just saying that it was just everything you could possibly ask for for a 150th Kentucky Derby. You know, you mentioned high, so that leads me into my next question. Like, as someone who's come into this world, at least publicly, in the last several years, what's your impression of how the sport is addressing those safety issues and those drug issues? Because obviously, we're steeped in it. Like, we we are bred to be cynical in racing and, right. you know, just accept any positive change that, that we can, but accept it with a grain of salt. What's your impression? We don't have to talk beta-methasone, do we? We don't have to talk picograms. Do no, we? No, no, pe- we no picograms. About the specific <laughs> drugs. I mean, I, I, I've, I've had some, my head's about to explode moments around this sport <laughs> over the last four or five years, as we all have, right? Uh, right. We're, we're, we're not alone. But um, so, so I'll, I'll, I'll start with this. This sport really needs to have its act together because it is a niche sport. Uh, because you don't have the massive arms of football and basketball and baseball and all of that, the sport's got to have its stuff right. And right now, everybody is fractured in places where what's good for them is what they want, right? And there's no Roger Goodell, and there's no Adam Silver, and there's no Bob Manfred, there's no Gary Bettman, there's no Don Garber, there's no commissioner, no Kathy Engelbrecht, right? Right. We need somebody to kind of do things in the best interest of the sport. And to that extent, HISA is a little bit of that because it allows what's happening in Maryland and what's happening with Naira and what's happening in California and Kentucky and Texas to all be on the same rules. So a horse is not running on one thing here and can't run on it there, right? That that helps this this cannot survive as a local or regional sport. It needs a national connectivity for big events. So to have some national rules, that helps a lot. Now, I do not pretend to be the horsemen who understand where the struggles are with these rules and where the issues are and where it's too much. One state thinks this, the other state thinks that. We, we've got to find some common ground. So I think HISA is a long way of saying HISA is – a good step to start to nationalize a sport that I think needs to be nationalized. It's going to have its regional pockets of strength and those regional pockets of strength beget power. But I think that power, you know, when over exercised, not for the national good of the game, hurts the sport long-term. So what Heiss is doing without the specifics of it is probably a step in the right direction for everyone because you want the better to know, that the races are clean, right? Yeah. Yeah. And the best, and why do you want that? Because it's your money. That's why, you know, when there's an inquiry thrown up there or there's some, some decision that's made to take a, take a horse down a spot or disqualify a horse, there needs to be an explanation of that because it's your money that you're wagering in the paramutual pool yep. that's creating the revenue stream for the entirety of the sport. So we need that. And if Heist is a step to help get everybody with a little more clear air, then that's good. Right. Yep. No question. And and Mike, I got two questions. One of which you, you just brought up, which was the inquiry or 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 lack thereof in in the Derby. I'd love to have your opinion on that. And 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 the first one I was going to ask you was: You're a handicapper. You look at at the twenty horses that are that are getting the starting gate of the Derby. Are you looking at it as as a gambler saying, "I think this horse is going to win," or are you looking at it as 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 an overarching like this is going to be a great story if so and so wins? So, so it's interesting because of the volume of people who do this on a regular basis. I will look at what the handicappers look at, look at, but I don't try to handicap the race. I look at it for a sense of where's the early speed. Uh, obviously, watch all the Derby preps. I probably do more of looking at it from that angle for the Derby prep races than the Derby itself, only because my job in the Derby is so large. It, it'll span the fashion stuff and the celebrity stuff and the stories of the horsemen and the trainer jockey connections all the way through the undercard that to get lost in the minutia that Randy and Jerry live in all the time, or that Eddie Olchek and Matt Bernier are working on and Steve Kornacki, even to a certain extent, at some point, we don't need another person doing that, right? And, and and I'm not qualified to do it. So, you know, stay in your lane. I I, I do look for my own interest. I, I will say that when we get 
to the Preakness and the undercard for the Preakness. And uh, certainly when we did the Belmont, that undercard as well, I probably looked at that more from a betting standpoint than mm-hmm. I did store. It's, it's just manageable. It's not 20 horses. Right. 20 horses, when you do the human connections of jockeys, trainers, and these multiple ownership groups, you're talking about 70, 75 people who you want to be able to recognize on a moment's notice when they win a race or what their connection is here and their right. history, backstory. So to spend time on that as opposed to spending time on uh, what, what, what was this horse, what was this horse's breeze three weeks ago at Oakland before coming up here, that's for those guys to do. So, right. so, right. so there's that perspective of it. I think the Derby is such a fascinating race. The more I'm around it, the more I'm intrigued by um, – Great horses usually perform well, but there's always a unicorn. I mean, right. almost every year I've done this race, there's a unicorn. And it was one of those things, there was so much going on after the race. The the one, two, three finish, uh, the jostling and the bumping down the stretch, obviously, that you guys were, were referring to a moment ago. I almost didn't realize that T.O. Password finished fifth. Right, <laughs> right. I, and, I, and, I, and he lost the stick. The jockey yes, lost the stick. Yes, yeah. I saw that in the last replay. And when when we got right away, I was trying to trying to navigate through what was going on there. And I just tried to get people, because we're still waiting on the results, trying to get people the results, right? And I'm just kind of running through one, two, three, and four. And, and T.O. Password finished. He's like, T.O. Password finished fifth? Where'd that come from, right? So that just this this is such a unique and cool race. You get multiple horses ending up in the top five or six that you never thought you'd see there. So fa- fascinating stuff. Um, you know, in terms of the jostling down the stretch, I, I thought this was an interesting conversation. We do visit with the Kentucky Horse Racing Commission steward, chief steward Barbara Borden, mm-hmm. off air on the Friday before the Derby, just to go over update regulations, rules, all this kind of stuff. And the one thing that Barb did say to us was we look at those replays multiple times. We usually wait a little bit longer before we put up official on the Derby results. And it did take a while. We had the photo was done pretty quickly. Right. And I think for the audience on a race like that, I wish we would have had the photo right away and then the rest of it later on. Yeah. Right. Mm-hmm. Because right. Yeah. I think I finally explained to the audience we're not getting the photo until the race is official. The race is not official until they go through all the head on and all the other angles. They're using a drone angle as well, by the way, at Churchill. Right. So they've got another angle in there to look at. So I'm sure they looked at all of that in the, uh, in the re- in the review, including the you know, Tyler Gaffleyone Heisman pose that uh, <laughs> became the, the still frame that, you know, that, that was, that was quite something. That was, uh, it was quite a, right. quite a shot that was captured for sure. Yep. Yeah, uh, absolutely. Uh, and so a lot of discussion about that, obviously. And, and I think I think what he was trying to do was make sure that the horses didn't clip heels. I think after the wire, they were so in sync that it could have been dangerous if they had clipped heels it's a great right point. after the wire. It's a great yeah. point. I, I, I can't wait to hear from Tyler more about it. Hopefully right. he'll be at Pimlico and we can talk about the Triple Crown, where that what that thing is now. But uh, hopefully yeah. Tyler will, will be there and we get a chance to uh, hear from him about it and – you know, it's a trend, and to Randy and Jerry's credit, they, they nailed that right away. You know, that mm-hmm. that has happened over and over and over with Sierra yeah. Leone, and we, we knew what was co- – we knew it could have come, and it actually yeah. did. And maybe yeah. if, if neither of those horses have that happen, maybe maybe that's the winning horse. Right. Yeah. You know? No, I, I think they might have both cost each other the race. I think so. You know, I think so, too. Better. Yeah. Yep. Yeah. But all three obviously ran winning races. That's what made it so fascinating. Yeah. I'm, I'm curious, you know, you have such a, a wealth of knowledge of all sorts of different sports and all sorts of different broadcasts. What are some of the unique challenges or some of the things that get you excited about broadcasting something like the Derby relative to the Stanley Cup playoffs or golf um, or, or football? Stay there a second. Hang on. Let me just reach over here. I think I got it somewhere over here. Still on my desk. Still, <laughs> have my, no- still have my notebook. I haven't unpacked yet. The notebook. Um, wow. Old school. Like us. Yeah, because there's just so much stuff in the Derby. I've got, like, you know, the past performance from the last 10 Derbies. Here's what makes the Derby unique, guys. I'll give you something to go give people. This is our rundown for the show. Very it's cool. It's 25 wow. pages. There's wow. five hours of TV of, like, let's pick a random moment here. Here's uh, here's Ahmed, Ahmed Farid's report with Tyler Gaff-Leon right there on that wow. line right there. 
and that came at uh, was scheduled to come at five nineteen forty five on the show. So um, wow. the, the show the show has twenty nine different segments during the day. So that that's what makes it unique. It is um, you know uh, full credit to our producer Lindsay Shanzer, who is just a complete rock star and has done the last three derbies and does a lot of our derby coverage during the year. But that that's what makes it different. You know, it's a football game. You've got two teams. They're right in front of you. Uh, you're calling the game, and it's going to take three hours, and it's a lot of action. Mm-hmm. With horse racing, we have a five-hour, 15-minute show, I think it turned out to be the other day, and we've got probably nine and a half minutes to ten minutes of actual racing in the show. <laughs> Yeah, it's a lot of airtime. And, so. and and you're serving an audience. Now, now the people who are probably watching this are diehard horse racing fans who would much rather have full 35-minute analysis of every race coming up on the card because the grade ones are grade twos. That, that can happen and does not draw the audience that this draws because of making a mint julep, $15,000 bottle of bourbon, my old Kentucky home, the feature on Larry Demerit, the stories that make the Derby a mass appeal audience to America. And I, I, underst- I understand the frustration of that, but it, if you think about what we do, you have to serve your audience and serve your customer. And the customer here has shown to over-index to people who are not hardcore racing fans. I think the Preakness show becomes more about the race Certainly the shows we do, I'm not on as many of them. Ahmed usually hosts hosts those shows or Brittany Erton. Those shows that are all the derby lead-ins, all the all the tune-ups of the derby, all, all of those shows, those undercards as well, Breeders' Cup, those are hardcore racing shows, you know? So you got to be able to play, play that card. So that's what's different about it. It makes it a fun show. It's the most unique show that I've ever been a part of. Um, and it's a huge challenge, and we have 15 people on the air, and uh, they're all great talents. So it's it's one of the most enjoyable experiences professionally that you can have. It it wears you out. The old fashioned sure. seven, oh, yeah. the old fashioned at 8:30 tastes really good. It's yeah, it's a yeah, it's, it's a it's a long it, it's a long it's a long couple of days. But man, is it uh, is it a fun broadcast to be a part of? Really is. I've always said that. Yeah, I've always said that. It's like it's that's got to be the most challenging broadcast because you do have to straddle that line between the hardcore horse players and the casual fans, and you guys do a phenomenal job of it. Go ahead, John. Yeah, and Mike, the only thing I would correct you on is that we do have hardcore fans, but most of them are groupies for Joe. So we <laughs> also have to have a little sex, uh, you know, sex sells mm-hmm. right. for Joe. He's got to flash the smile. You know, sure. it's all part of it. But we oh, know yeah. our audience. We know our Ranger, audience. Like, Ranger jersey. You know, you, Ranger you can't jersey. beat it. Well, Exactly. What, what, it should have been on the carpet, red carpet at the Met Gala. I don't know. <laughs> Who said I wasn't? Yeah, that's right. Per, that's perhaps, right. Perhaps so Mike, it, just it, almost, covered. it almost sounds to me like if I'm reading the tea leaves right, that like you'd be interested in someday owning a horse. Is that is that a possibility? <laughs> what tea leaves are you reading? Right? I'm, <laughs> I've, I've seen the silliness of, of this business in this industry. You do have to say, I, I got involved with the group many, many, many years ago with a small piece of it. And, and just seeing other people who I know who've done a little piece of it here and there, you, right. you understand why. And, and you see the joy. I, I love the My Racehorse concept. You know, and uh, D. Wayne Lucas uh, trained a My Racehorse horse that won on the undercard of the Derby, yeah. right? He mm-hmm. sees the gray. Yeah, Exactly. 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 Who who Wayne has said maybe we'll see in the Preakness, right? Yeah. So yeah. that's that's great. That that um, that gives you a little taste of what the energy of horse racing can be, and that's why those stories I think can be interesting, guys, because oftentimes the the stories are of people who make money that none of us will ever dream of making, and their involvement in horse racing. When there is an everyday person who's involved with it, it brings a great connection and passion. Uh, to the to the sport in general, to the horse racing fans as well. So I, I do I do love those concepts, but I also see the reality that so many of the horses never see, never see the track. You know, as uh, as we do with the numbers every year to remind viewers. I love that this year we have eighteen thousand or so just under foals born three years right. ago, and only half only half ever make it to to the concept of racing here, right? And then yep. you start breaking yep. it down to the those that get in graded stakes races to the 20 win the Derby and it's, you know, yeah. one, one in 18,000 chance of that population that you're going to win the Derby. 
which is pretty yeah. cool. Yeah. I thought Steve did a great job of breaking that down on the whiteboard. I thought he that was really great. And that, that definitely helped the, the non-racing audience and reminded the racing audience of exactly how difficult it is. Well, that's it. Reminded the racing audience because there's a number in there, just a number of horses that get integrated stakes races, right? Out, right. out of that right. crop of three-year-old foals. Like, wow, that's... It's not not a not a number. I thought it might have been more. I was a little surprised at that number. So it's fun that we kind of do that every year. The international connection to the jockeys. There there are so many stories to tell, and you know you, you can spend five hours, and we didn't really tell the story of Mystic Dan, right? So right, right, right. Yeah. Usually the yeah. joy that comes with the Preakness, and uh, you know, for selfish reasons, for the sport, you hope that the horse runs in the Preakness. Uh, but you know, I understand. Kenny McPeak said, I've, I've got recent history to say this is not the wisest thing for this horse. Uh, we'll wait and see what happens. But I, I think the indus- the way the industry has adjusted, um, it, if, I always find it humorous that the people who say that there's tradition and there's history and we can't change this haven't hit the table that hard that the Belmont's a mile and a quarter this year. <laughs> right don't, don't worry they're complaining behind closed doors. no i no, I, I know there are complaints but i've seen yeah, some people yeah. who've said one not not say the other you know it's yeah. it, it's not easy look no we don't see horses in two weeks we don't just doesn't happen anymore yeah so if you're thinking this sport is 150 years old in this triple crown type phase era how do we evolve it right mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. you know we we do play Major League Baseball games where we put the runner on second in the 10th inning. I know it doesn't happen in the playoffs, but we do that. Right. We've moved the kickoff 100 times in football. We're going to move it for the 101st time coming up here this year. Right. In, in baseball, you can't shift anymore, right? For 100 yep. years, you can move people wherever you wanted. So right. sports do change and evolve. Basketball had no three-point line. Three point, yep, exactly. Now, now it does, right? Hockey overtimes are three-on-three three in the regular season. Every sport has evolved. The mound in 1968 with Bob Gibson, you know, right. raised, lowered, right. right? The pitching year. Right. So it, we evolve in every sport. And I just think this sport has one thing that everybody gets. It's the triple crown. Every right. sports fan gets. So if you want to continue to grow and appeal the sport, and the horsemen are the ones telling you, the trainers, the owners, they're telling you, not every two weeks. We space them out to every month. That's right. the way, and now we we are breeding horses to other horses who work on that same timeline. Then, then why do we have one of the three biggest races of the year two weeks after the first one? Because we've done it for a hundred something years. Back it up to Memorial Day weekend. Back the Belmont up. It doesn't have to be July Fourth if you want to do something um, important and unique and satisfying for the Naira. Uh, betting public on 4th of July that's not the Belmont. Move that Belmont to the last week of June then. That's fine. Right. And then have right. your big your big week on the 4th of July. I, I, I just don't see why it's not going to be better for everybody in the sport. And Mike, does that, does that coincide with the scheduling for, for NBC? Because I know we, you guys just added an extension to um, to work with the Triple Crown. But one of the things in the Breeders' Cup that, that, was, you know, that was a problem was Notre Dame football. So if, if we spread out the Triple Crown from NBC's standpoint, would, right. that, would that work as well? Because that's always been a big sticking point. Yeah, you know, what? I don't have the programming list here, nor is it my job. But I'm right. sure our guys would find some place for it for, for Memorial Day weekend. We're currently running the Indy 500 on Memorial Day weekend. The, the French Open's always been around in, in that stretch, but we'd find a place for it on Memorial Day weekend somewhere. Memorial Day weekend also gives you the option of Saturday and Sunday as well, and Monday for that and matter. Monday. So yeah. you've, you've got you've got a lot of different options. I'm sure it would end up there. You know, the Breeders' Cup has had weekends where it coincides with Notre Dame football, and there are workarounds to that. And now we have Big Ten football, and you find a way to – Work it around. There are different platforms. You can put the early part of the day, the late part of the day, be on the West Coast in a different time slot. It, it, it's worked out. All these things are workable. But again, you have first and everything that's going on in the Maryland racing scene that has their best interest in mind. And is Memorial Day weekend great for them? I don't know. Right? They'd have to tell us that. And then you have Naira, who has their interests and their great success with the timing of Belmont, Belmont, 4th of July weekend, late weekends in June, and obviously a Saratoga card that has continued to grow and expand and grow and expand here. As you know, I remember when it was just a shorter card. Now mm-hmm. it feels like it's two thirds of the summer, if not the whole summer, which is great because right. it's an unbelievable yeah. place. So how do you get the best interest of Churchill Downs 
Maryland and First and Naira on the same page to make the one thing. I keep coming back. It's the one thing <laughs> the sport has. Mm-hmm. How do you make it better? And right. are are they all together in a room saying this is how we do it? That's what I think is probably the one thing I would say in my eight years around the sport that is uh, disappointing and can get better. And it, it can get better. They just need mm-hmm. to cooperate. Yeah. Well, cooperation is not our strong suit in race. You know, you know what it reminds me of, Joe? You know what it reminds me of a little bit is the PGA Tour. Now, there's one entity there and there's a commissioner there, mm-hmm. but all the golfers are independent contractors, right? Mm-hmm. So when we're saying, hey, we're going to do this, we're going to play these events, maybe Justin Thomas or Scotty Scheffler or somebody else doesn't want to play that event that week. And so you have a lot of people who you're trying to get them all in the same place, even though there's not a union and it's not collectively bargained. So it's it reminds me when I see some of these issues of of that. Again, there's health in places in this racing industry. The whole thing's not wrong, but there are steps that a commissioner would come in tomorrow and make. And I talked to Mike Rapoli about this at length on uh, Wednesday of last week. There are moves that can be made quickly that don't take any power away from anybody, but helps make right. the sport better. I hope they can get together and do that. Because w- when it's good, it's unbelievable. It, the, the sport when this sport is right it, it's one of the cool experiences there's nothing like it there's absolutely nothing like it and you know i just i, don't, I hope you don't have to get out of here too soon because i no. just wanted to ask a quick follow-up on the on the rapoli thing because i'm sure you've seen like he's the self-appointed commissioner <laughs> yeah. of horse racing <laughs> and he's a guy who does have a lot of passion obviously has a lot of money and power right. what was your sense of him coming out of that interview see Here's the deal, and I've known him for a little bit now. I grew up in Queens, so I'm Mike from Queens, and he's Mike from Queens. And we battle on a regular basis. Who's the Mike from Queens? I tell him I'm older, but he's he's got billions more than me, so we, I, I let him win. Um, <laughs> I, 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 love, I love Rapoli. I do. That doesn't mean I agree with everything he says, right. but I love him because he doesn't need this, and he wants to be a part of it. And he's willing to put out solutions. He's willing to discuss issues. But he has a passion for the sport that is genuine and real and cares about it a lot. And I've I've had the conversation that we had uh, that aired partially on our NBC show on Saturday is a conversation that we had in large part a year ago on Thursday of Derby Week back at the Barnes. And uh, we've had that conversation a few years ago, when, when uh, Mike and Vinny Viola were together with Vino Rosso, uh, we, we we ended up connecting, really getting to meet and getting to know both of those two gentlemen. And I, I just had, he's a, he's a businessman, he's a sportsman, he's a communicator, he has vision and ideas. And I love that he's willing to share. He doesn't need this. He does not need this right now, right? In, in his business life or his life, but he has chosen to embrace it uh, because he thinks the sport can get better. And I really appreciate that. So uh, I, I hope I hope some of his ideas get to uh, the reality. The one that he shared with me that we did not get in the piece, which was important. I said, if you're a commissioner tomorrow, what's the first thing you do? And he talked about thoroughbred aftercare. Mm-hmm. And he's putting significant money, millions, towards thoroughbred aftercare uh, so that when three- and four-year-old horses are done running, they can be retrained to to do jumping or to do other things just to just to have some other purpose in the thoroughbred aftercare in his mind is one of the most important things and that if all the stakeholders would contribute something to that it right. would help the industry at, at at a total total win and it was a great point i thought i know after one of our podcasts where, where we criticized mike he was going to try to repurpose some of the horses to be podcast hosts um, so <laughs> that you know and i can i can see that that makes a ton of sense that's um, mike his, his best horse may be, for the Preakness, may be Mind Frame. Did you have a chance to, to watch that? I know it was early in the card, but did you have a chance to watch that horse, the Constitution Colt? Uh, yes, I did. Yeah, yes, I did. And and you might be right. And that's one of those interesting things, right? That the, that the That's what I think I didn't realize about the sport until I got involved in being close to the Derby and and the Triple Crown. We did the Triple Crown events my first six years. This is the second year that we're not doing all three. Uh, the the first the first thing I noticed was how you know these horses mature 
at different times and it's so significant, right? We, you know, why would you see a horse that's only run twice or three times all of a sudden be a derby contender compared to a, a horse in the past performances who used about seven, eight races and six or seven of them are good, right? So just because that one is ticketed and we have put that horse in that place doesn't mean it's the best three-year-old in somebody's barn or in somebody's stable in, in this case. And it, it was fascinating because I thought I really thought fierceness was – set up for a good race as well. And wouldn't it be interesting if, if fierceness's next race is a dominant win? Right. And you go every, win, yeah, every other. not yeah. sure, win, not sure, yeah. win. It, it would be really interesting to see if, if that plays out again, it's going to be one of those head scratches, right? You never know which horse is going to have that day. That, and, and the trip too. Think of the trip Mystic Dan right. got, right? Yeah. You, you know, yeah. I was like Sunday to go back and watch the replay, and then you just watch the three all the way around and go, wow, yeah. Brian was on the rail and just stayed there. Stayed I there. mean, yep. stayed yep. there. Yep. You know, I always, I always love Rand, Randy Moss's, and they're the best. I'll tell you something about them in a second. Randy's always the numbers guy. Mm-hmm. And I always love to hear from Randy who ran the shortest derby right. and who ran – the longest derby, right? Yeah, yeah. And I, I don't even have to wait. I, there's no way anybody had a shorter derby than Mystic Dan. <laughs> it's, just a, it's, not even a, it's not even a conversation. Let me just say this. I, I've worked with a ton of Hall of Fame people in uh, different sports, and even people who are not Hall of Fame are great broadcasters too, um, and analysts in studio and play-by-play. I've worked with a ton of different golfers, tennis athletes, you name it, all the, all the sports. They're no finer duo than Randy Moss and Jerry Bailey. Uh, their work ethic, we sit in a trailer all week, work at an office trailer. Like they're sitting over here. I'm over here next to our producer, and two of our other um, producers are sitting right across from us, six of us in this trailer space working. And there's a stack this high, and it's their notes, and they're on their iPads, and they're calling trainers. And they've got this list and they work together like, you know, like hand in glove. It's just, it's really awesome. And to look this way on the show and anything you want to ask or want to say, you don't even have to think about it twice. One of them's going to answer it. One of them's going to get it right. And we'll share information during the show. Like, hey, you know, don't forget this. Don't forget you said that. <clears throat> After every race, Randy will always kind of look over at me. He's like, hey, do you have this? And I might be sitting on the info, but it's kind of smile at each other. They're, they're two of the most giving, talented people on the air as well. And they've been doing this for a long, long, long time. And nobody comes close to what they have done on TV for this many years. And I, I hope uh, that is recognized and appreciated by the viewers. And I, I wish there was a way the industry in general – could uh, say thank you to them for 20 plus years of being the combo that has been the standard in uh, television an- analysis of the sport. Well, you, my friend, are the standard, I think. Nah. I know. Nah, You're I just, the standard, man. And and listen, and I one thing, and this is the last question for me. Sure. Your versatility is amazing. The, the amount of different sports that you can cover and speak intelligently and fluently about is just it's something to behold and you got the olympics coming up the paris 2024 olympics what do you how how early do you get there how soon do you dive into all the stories what are you looking forward to give, give me a little primer about mike Tarico at the olympics well hold holding up and hold, i was gonna say i think propped up on this computer are some of my olympic manuals here uh it, it, <laughs> it's not surprising it, it start it started it's a constant it's it's a great thrill, too, to be a part of. Uh, the Olympics are uh, the one event that brings America together uh, in so many different ways. And you can go to a third world country and say the word Olympian and people know what you're talking about. So you're talking about a, an event, a competition that is just, you know, as great as it gets. And the last three have been far away from people. They've been in Asia, Pyeongchang, South Korea, and then Tokyo, and then Beijing. And two of those three were during COVID with no fans in the stands. So uh, the Olympics really need a boost and uh, just a great injection of passion and energy. And that's what Paris is. Paris is an amazing place. It's that type of place where if you've been there, you can't wait to go back. And if you haven't been there, you can't wait to see it for the first time. And it'll be the backdrop for a lot of the events. I don't know if you guys know, beach volleyball is going to be contested right at the foot of the Eiffel Tower. There's a temporary stadium built. 
sand coming in. The Eiffel Tower will be the backdrop for beach volleyball. Some of those, quote, urban sports like uh, three-on-three basketball, which is played on, you know, kind of a sport court that's outside. Uh, skateboarding, which is new to the Olympics the last couple. BMX cycling, right? Those are going to be contested at Place de la Concorde, which is about two blocks away from the U.S. Embassy. Place is Plaza in French. It's one of the most uh, historic, spectacular plazas. Uh, the equestrian stuff is going to be at Versailles. Uh, so they're using the great iconic sites and venues of Paris as venues for competition. So that'll be a big part of it. And uh, I've been over three times already before the games here over the last 12 months. And I'll get back over a week before the games. And uh, we, we look forward to the excitement of it and hope that America enjoys watching what I think is going to be a really good Team USA, especially in track and field. Uh, you know, usually good in swimming, usually terrific in gymnastics, likely to be the case again. But I think track and field might be the place where the U.S. has the most success. That'll be the second week of the games. Uh, and that might be the thing that if the U.S. pulls to the top of the medal count in both gold medals and overall medals, it will probably be the strength, on the strength of the track and field team over the last eight or nine days of the games. It'll be fun. Can't wait, man. Mike, thank you so much for the time and the expertise. And thank you for doing Racing Proud, man. I honestly, I, I could not think of a better person to helm those broadcasts. Keep up the great work. And thanks for talking to us, man. That's very kind. Thank you both. It's been a pleasure to be on with you. And Joe, who's your favorite Ranger of all time? Ooh, that's a tough one. I got it. I mean, I got the Adam Fox jersey on. So I Adam Fox? Foxy. Nice. There you go. That's I gotta fine. give Foxy the pop. He's nice. he's just you know he's a New York guy. Grew up yep. as a diehard as diehard Ranger fan, and he's just he's brilliant to watch. Because and I'm I'm sure you appreciate this. I love the guys that are not dependent on athleticism. Mm -hmm. Smarts, hands, and just the way he sees the game. It's amazing to watch. Well, as somebody who's not athletic, I have a fondness too for people who <laughs> exactly. lack the athleticism of other athletes, but. I, I, so I, I'm a, I'm a, I grew up a Ranger fan. The Rangers and the Mets were the two teams I grew up passionate about. And John Davidson, the goalie, John Davidson, and then went on to a great TV career, and then in the front yeah. office with Columbus and St. Louis. JD was the man. That, that was that was my. He was he stood on his head more nights in helping the Rangers get to the Cup final uh, in the in the late '70s, early '80s, before they eventually won it back in '94. So yeah. fun times. Yeah. Good to see them yeah. good again. It's really fun. Yep. Yeah. Mike, yeah. Mike, you'll be happy to hear that we've named horses Degrom and Nimmo, and and I have a Nyquist that's named Brodeur. That 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 that's, is a two year old this year. That that is absolutely fabulous. That that, that does Marty know about that? No, no, we'd have to pay him fees for that. that oh, okay, okay. <laughs> just let, let, no, no, let no. him take. He, he hasn't he hasn't run yet, but he's he's a son of Nyquist, and he's a two year old. You should keep an eye on at Saratoga. Brodeur, Brodeur. All right. If if I lose the twenty, I'm calling. You. Absolutely. <laughs> <laughs> 20 I can handle. <laughs> okay, you got it. All the best, guys. Yeah, yeah, Thank yeah, you yeah. for having me. It was Thank a pleasure so to be with you. Oh, Jesus. man, this was so much fun. <laughs> <laughs>